do whatever is necessary to survive, even if it means tearing the world apart. Held at gunpoint, Kufa Vampire is outnumbered. Unknown assailants fire a barrage of bullets at him. However, Kirito, I mean, Kufa, speeds towards the attackers while deflecting all of the projectiles with just his blade. He successfully outmaneuvers each and every one of them. Slice, lunge, pierce, kill, with the cronies all falling to their deaths. One remains, the bandaged man with an evil smirk, William Jin. Kufa speedily lunges into an attack, but Jin surprisingly defends himself. What organization are these villains from anyways? Jin doesn't seem too interested in chit chat, so the two engage in an offense-defense battle, with neither one drawing an edge. It's not until Oyaji, the White Knight's leader, aka father, intervenes. He calmly asks Jin if he's found notable intel, but Jin sarcastically tells him to go and ask the head of the house, Lord Elsness himself. If only the lord in the corner was still alive and breathing. Now outnumbered, Jin uses his cunning to successfully escape. Not that Kufa cares. He's more concerned about all the unanswered questions Lord Elsness took with him to the grave. After some time, Kuva boards a train for another mission, seemingly connected to the earlier events. His destination? Humankind's last standing city-state, the world within the Lantern, Flandor. In this world, Canbells, where the city blocks are housed, are connected by magical glass tubes. These state-of-the-art city walls protect the people from the dark entities gnawing away at night, the Lankanthropes. Kufa meets a chirpy pink-headed woman, Rosetti Prickett, and helps her with her bags, and she calls him a gentleman. As the two take separate routes, Kufa arrives at a mansion where he is greeted by a trio of maids. Amy, the head maid, leads Kufa on a tour around the residence where he's set to work for the next three years. Amy. In the midst of her talk, senses their lady's presence. There, perched on the balcony's balustrade, is Kufa's new mission. A child of the legendary house angel, Melida Angel, Kufa takes in the sight before him. Beautiful long, blonde hair and red eyes. When Amy calls out to the lady, Melinda instantly covers up her skirt as she spots Kufa amongst the maids. Her new tutor gives her a charming smile and the young lady instantly loses her balance on the balcony ledge. Everyone, of course, panics. As Melinda braces for impact, time slows down. Kufa manages to catch the falling lady like a knight in shining armor, in this case black. He asks if she's hurt, and she just blushes. It appears she's fine and takes the time to introduce herself to her new instructor. Amy then informs Melida that they have to head to St. Fredisfied Girls Academy, the prestigious school for noble children where Melida currently studies. Kufa reveals that he's not only going to be her instructor, but also her personal attendant wherever she goes. Later at the academy, Melida and Kufa are calmly walking through the hallways when one of Melida's classmates, Nerva, condescendingly calls her out for being late. From Melida's body language, it's clear to say that she isn't very comfortable in Nerva's presence. To add insult to the injury, Nerva asks, Is he here to instruct you in your studies? Or in the use of mana? Referring to Kufa who quietly observes this interaction. She has the Nerva to bully our little Melida like that. She goes on to command Melida to be her training partner. Even though the latter just arrived, she complies with this order. Kufa continues to observe the two training, noting Melida's beautiful form. Melida's skill is clearly on another level, but Nerva has the support of her magical power. This is what tips the scales. Nerva is a mana user, while Melida has yet to awaken hers. Thus, this training spark concludes with Melida in the losing end. Mana is a power that grants only the chosen noble class various powers and physical boosts. This power usually awakens at the age of 7, but Melida hasn't shown any sign yet. The pressure is immense, as she's a daughter of one of the three big aristocratic houses, House of Angel, and its signature paladin mana. Unfortunately, Melida has been dubbed as an incompetent, talented girl, now not only spurned by her family, but also bullied by her classmates. There are limits to hard work when you just don't have the firepower. After defeating Melida, Nerva once again mocks her for her dream of joining the elite magic unit Crest Legion and becoming the people's Sword of Hope. 
And when we think that she's done with a degrading language, this little snot chooses to continue. She asks Melody if the latter knows that her cousin, Elise, has just secured a new tutor that happens to be an elite member of the Crest Legion. The timid Elise doesn't appear happy about the bullying here. The infuriating Nerva rubs salt into the wound by mentioning that Elise has already awakened her paladin mana. With special guidance, she's likely to join the Crest Legion in no time. Speechlessly hurt, Melida runs away and Elise goes on to follow her. Understandably frustrated, Melida asks Elise if she's there to mock her too. The latter tries to reason with her, even using her nickname Lita. Sadly, this only upsets Melida even further. A deafening silence echoes throughout the halls. The sister-like bond between cousins is now under intense strain. Melida finally runs away, tears flowing from her eyes, while remembering her childhood and her happy memories of her mother. The irony of Melida being weak but wanting to join the strongest guild bothers Kufa. Now that night, Kufa can't help but think about his mission. Melida's grandfather, Lord Mordru, questions whether the Manalus Melida is a true child of the House of Angel. There are rumors that the now-dead Lord Elsness got dirty with Melida's wealthy but commoner-born mother, Lady Melinoa. Left with no choice, Oyaji assigns the specialist Kufa to tutor Melida into becoming a battle maiden befitting an aristocratic house. Kufa finishes writing his report and concludes that she isn't a biological daughter of the Knight Duke, Felgus Angel. Consequently, his next move should be to assassinate her. It's not something that must be done ASAP. However, he now sees this as a form of mercy killing since she would only be fated to experience endless suffering, working earnestly towards a goal she can never achieve. Ending her life now would be part of his assassin's pride. With his weapons and potion ready, Kufa ventures out to find Melida, but she isn't in her room. Where could she be at this late hour? Outside, Melida is running for dear life as she's being chased by low-class lycanthropes. She slips all over the dark streets trying her very best to evade the monsters. Kufa, on the other hand, already senses Melida's whereabouts and the imminent danger she's in. He dashes towards her location and arrives to witness Melida cornered by some low-leveled lycanthropes. She's viciously putting up a fight with her wooden sword. Why are they in a city block on a lair this high up though? Like the lycanthropes. Remembering Oyaji's words, Kuva realizes these monsters must be Melida's grandfather, Lord Mordru's doing to pressure his granddaughter into awakening her paladin abilities. Although this strategy has never produced any positive effect in the past, the situation grows even dire when the lycanthropes successfully overpower Melida's wooden weapon, hurling the defenseless young lady to the ground. They prevent her from reaching for her sword, stepping on her arms and laughing at her pained state. On the ground and in tears, Melida has no choice but to accept a depressing beating of kicks and punches. Despite this, she doesn't give up. Kufa sees this from the shadows and wonders why Melida isn't calling for help. Her pain is multiplied when the lycanthropes grab her by the hair. This elicits a terrified reaction from Melida, since it's something precious that she remembers her mother by. One of the lycanthropes, devoid of any sympathy, prepares its scissors-like tool by her hair. Tears flow endlessly from her eyes as she begs for them to stop. If she were to call for help, soldiers could effortlessly dispatch these monsters. So why hasn't she yet? He gains a clue from something she says. Her blonde hair is her only signifying trait as part of the House of Angel. The real reason then hits Kufa. It would be seen as an admittance that she's weak and an illegitimate child of the family. <sighs> it truly is a bad joke. Kufa eerily says as he opens his eyes, now glowing a bright royal blue. It seems that our assassin has decided on his next course of action. Swiftly slicing through the monsters, Kufa commands the remaining lycanthropes to cease their attacks at once. The monsters beg for mercy in their own language, but Kufa is relentless in his execution. His whole body glows blue, indicative of his vast mana reserves. He skillfully ends the fight using his technique Phantom Blade Trident, Void Fan. 
All the Lakenthropes burn into ashes. Gufa immediately attends to Melida, apologizing for taking so long to save her. When offered a hand, Melida indirectly refuses Gufa's help and tries to compose herself as quickly as possible. She gets up on her own and apologizes for having caused her instructor trouble. She's always on her own, and Kufa wants to see it with his own two eyes. The moment this precious girl, who's been fighting with all she's got in this cruel world, is someday acknowledged. Kufa gently takes Melida's hands in his own, pleading to let him support and save her. No matter the storm Melida will find herself in, Kufa will never fail to respond to her call. That's an assassin's promise. Kufa's sincerity has her in tears. He asks once more, Milady, will you entrust me with your life? It's a risky gamble. But there is only one way to awaken Melida's mana, and it may even result in death if it fails. Even so, Melida agrees to Kufa's proposition. He bends the knee and kisses her hand. Just as Melida has entrusted her life to Kufa, he has staked his own life on hers as well. The blooming roses bear witness to this sacred procedure. Kufa sips the potion he prepared earlier, then gently lays his lips on Melida's. Her body slowly withers away, treading the fine line between life and death. It's like she's shedding, transforming. As her world grows darker and darker, a small blue light begins to emanate from the surroundings. It's game time. Awakening from her slumber, Melida receives a comprehensive checkup from Kufa to prevent any side effects. He finally confirms that she's officially acquired the ability to use mana. Now, all of this contact, especially in her sleepwear, makes the young girl feel embarrassed. She questions Kufa's unmindfulness of her femininity, to wish that he admits that he's also slightly embarrassed but doesn't let his feelings show. I care about you, Kufa explains to Melida, further saying how the thought of his procedure putting Melida in harm's way would guarantee him dozens of sleepless nights. His only wish is for her to remain healthy. Wow, this assassin has feelings. This somehow gains her full trust. Kufa reveals that Melida didn't inquire paladin class mana, but samurai class like his own. It might not be what her family desires, but Melida is more than happy to be like him. Now for the time being, the two agree on keeping Melida's mana a secret to prevent any dangerous scenarios. Kufa's hope is that she continues to nurture mana, befitting that of an aristocratic house, seeing as this is the only way they'd both survive. For the first time in forever, Melida finds herself excited to go to school as she has mana now. A smiling Kufa informs her she's forbidden to use mana outside their private lessons until the tournament a week from today. She has to endure more bullying for now, unfortunately. The next day is business as usual. Nerva, has still the nerve, continues to bully Melida, stealing a book from her this time. Just a bit more, Melida. Just a bit more. You can do it. Kufa continues to reassure Melida that her patience will pay off. Her mana should improve with more training. They need to keep Melida's classmates in the dark until the fated day when they witness an unprecedented miracle before their eyes. Their talk is cut short when Kufa calls out Elise and Rossetti, who happen to be spying on them. Rossetti, the girl from the train earlier, is Elise's newly acquired tutor and the famous youngest member of Crest Legion, despite her humble origins. She's even been given the title of Career Marquess by His Majesty the King. Despite her achievements, Rosetta remains humble, asking Melida to call her Rose instead. Now hoping to get along as fellow employees of House Angel, Rose eagerly shakes Kufa's hand, which he slaps away. Oh, rejected! Bluntly explaining why, Kufa says he doesn't have the luxury of getting along with a blithe woman who would only be bad influence on Melida. Plus, the ass instructors are also under the public eye's scrutiny. Where did the gentleman Rose met go? Shocked by this disrespect, Rose childishly vows to have Elise destroy Melida during the tournament. And so the day has finally arrived. Melida's terrified and shaking in her boots. 
but before the match, she spots her father and grandfather nearby. They're here to watch the tournament, so the stakes are now higher than ever. It's not like Kufa isn't worried though. Melodis only manifested half of her mana, and this tournament is basically life and death for the both of them. However, having both teacher and student panic will just make things worse. Adding more to Melodis' worries though, Nerva again approaches and mocks her for having joined another unit. The bully further drills into Melida how embarrassing it must be for her to be watched losing by her prestigious family. Nerva taunts the poor girl who's now crouched up on the floor. Having heard enough of this insolence, Kufa, finally, sarcastically interjects in the conversation with a My ears can't take any more of your jabbering, so can you please shut up? Ah, uh, dude, the look on Kufa's face, seriously. He could easily destroy this child in one slash, but instead settles for calling Nerva a monkey girl. This comment brings her temper to new heights, pointing a finger towards Kufa. And irked Nerva degrades him by saying he is only in this for the salary. Well, who doesn't work to get paid, you know? But no, someone's about to draw the line. Melinda rushes to get between Kufa and Nerva, slapping away the latter's hand and exclaiming how he's the best tutor there is. Like, it's one thing to insult and bully her, but no one should ever say nasty things about her precious teacher. Her classmates now bear witness to her swearing to destroy Nerva in the tournament. The bully calls her a hopeless failure and doesn't think much of this promise. Now the true battle begins. This tournament will decide the fate of this student-teacher duo. Rose casually sits beside Kufa in the stands, calling him the black-hearted sham gentleman and teasing him for feeling the pressure. He responds by shortening her lengthy surname to Miss Prick and, of course, this annoys her. Meanwhile, down on the tourney's makeshift battlefield, Melinda's team reassures the lady to ease her worries. Ugh, oh, finally students who are actually nice to her. Nerva, on the other side of the field, cockily chuckles with her team. Now let the games begin. Melinda's unit wastes no time charging off towards their opponent. Nerva stays behind to guard her team's post, but gets excited when she spots Melinda in the distance. This very girl she bullies is heading towards her with a look of determination on her face. This gets our little villain worked up too, ecstatic to find her prey running to the slaughter. She intends to destroy Melinda with one powerful strike to embarrass her in front of the crowd. Then all of a sudden, Melinda emits a golden hue and gathers enough mana to fend off nervous attack. She not only repels the attack, but sends the latter flying. Participants from both teams are astonished by this revelation. Even the crowd is surprised by the turn of events. Now this is the warrior princess you called worthless all this time. Realizing Melinda can now use mana only annoys Nerva even further. RMC takes advantage of this and executes a faint kick that easily passes through Nerva's defense, burying her into the ground once more. Oh, that's a double whammy to her pride. Now it's Melinda who has the upper hand, explaining how one shouldn't solely be so focused on their opponent's weapons. We see some guerrilla warfare here with some sand-throwing tactics similar to her master Kufa. This blinds the bully and Melinda swats her to the wall once again, like a pesky mosquito. Nerva can't seem to accept defeat, not to a notorious failure like Melinda Angel. Nerva's fuming rage amplifies her mana. She uses the strongest tool in her arsenal, Garrick Hammer. This ruptures the battlefield and creates a moon crater with its impact. As expected, she acts all smug when she finds Melida helplessly on her knees. She ironically calls Melida her friend and promises to spare her if she surrenders. This little bully is definitely so drunk on her own egotistical talk that she doesn't notice how Melida's sword is on its way towards her neck. Instructor's attacks were even more frightening. A smirking Melinda remarks, provoking Nerva beyond comprehension. The two begin a dance of impassioned swordplay, but props to Melinda, of course, as she isn't giving Nerva room to retaliate. Both Rose and Kufa can tell that she's in pain, but it's nothing compared to the suffering she's endured until now. So this is child's play. As Melinda enacts her finishing blow to conclude the battle, the unthinkable happens. She exhausts all of her mana, 
Sadly, she has no choice but to go on the defense, grabbing her sword as she flees. Sadly, she is struck by one of Nerva's attacks and falls to the ground. The bully wants her to take back her sword, but Melida reiterates that she is nowhere near as terrifying as Kufa. This statement seems to bother her quite a lot since it pushes her to tears. You're just Melida! Just Melida! You're nothing! Nerva frustratingly cries out as she recalls their once blossoming friendship. Nerva wasn't actually a bully back then. They were once friends until they weren't. Hopefully the friendship was once real and not just Nerva taking advantage of Melida's inability to refuse as we see now. Nerva snaps her rival's sword in two. With her sword shattered, the odds are admittedly stacked against Melida. Her bully gathers all of her mana for a final executionary attack that might just permanently paralyze her. However, bejeweled things will always shine and the same goes for Melida. In the spur of the moment, Melida finally mimics one move she's been so keen on learning. Phantom Blade Flash, Wind Fang. It doesn't require a weapon, it actually conjures one out of air. Now with this technique, Nerva is ultimately rendered immobile and defeated. Meanwhile, Kufa is beyond shocked to see that Melinda has learned Phantom Blade just seeing him use it once. Huh, such a proud master moment. Grabbing Nerva's weapon, Melinda rushes towards the opponent's post with a condition for victory being to destroy it. Her teammates band together to defend her from enemy fire. At last, the mission is a success and Melinda is finally reborn as a force to be reckoned with. After the fight, Kufa lifts Melida up like a proud parent seeing her praises. This is when her actual father, though, passes by and sternly reminds her not to get too complacent after a single victory. Well, there's still so much in store for a little girl and we can't wait for how powerful she's going to become. You know what they say. Those who have experienced what it's like at the bottom knows how to relish the feeling at the top. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.